inquiry into the matter. At 1.20 a.m. Eastern Time, that's 10.20 p.m. Pacific, we'll turn to a hearing concerning the cancellation of the Navy's A-12 attack aircraft program and the deferment of $1.35 billion of payments owed to the U.S. government by defense contractors. The House Government Operations Subcommittee met Wednesday to continue its investigation into the A-12 program. After that, you'll see a discussion about the most favored nation trade status for China. Representatives Nancy Pelosi and Barney Frank, two of the House sponsors of legislation setting conditions on MFN, spoke with Youth for Democratic Action earlier today. That's a brief look at the schedule ahead here on C-SPAN. Thanks for joining us. Want to learn more about the highest court in the land? Then order Justice for All, a valuable reference tool for anyone who follows the proceedings of the judicial branch of government. Justice for All gives an inside look at the history of the Supreme Court of the United States and examines the role and influence of the court today. If you enjoy C-SPAN's continuing series, America and the Courts, or Supreme Court Review, you'll find Justice for All a viewing companion you'll turn to again and again. To order your copy of Justice for All, send a check or money order for $3 to Justice for All, care of C-SPAN, 400 North Capitol Street, Suite 650, Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20001. Up next, we take you to the Rayburn House office building here on Capitol Hill for coverage of a hearing concerning life insurance guarantee funds and the recent failure of several major insurance companies. The House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Competitiveness met to take testimony from a state insurance commissioner, the president of the National Organization of Life and Health Insurance Associations, and a representative of the American Council of Life Insurance. Representative Curtis Collins chaired today's session. Good morning. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Competitiveness of the Energy and Commerce Committee will come to order. Today's hearing will focus on the system of state guarantee funds that are designed to protect policyholders of failed life insurance companies. These funds have been referred to as, quote, a patchwork quilt with holes in it, end quote. But those who depend on insurance companies for their livelihood or pensions deserve better. Our first two witnesses illustrate the importance of an adequate guarantee fund system. Olga Pegalo's executive life annuity has been reduced 30 percent. Thelma Honeycutt's plans for retirement may be seriously affected because she is expecting an executive life annuity. Last week, when one of the largest thrifts here in Washington fell, it was open for business the next day and depositors could remove any or all of their money. But this isn't the case when a life insurance company is insolvent because the government guarantees bank deposits, but only industry-run guarantee associations protect insurance policyholders. To begin with, not all states have guarantee funds. Currently, there are still two jurisdictions without them, Louisiana and the District of Columbia. There are significant differences among the various state funds resulting in gaps in coverage. For example, in many cases, the so-called guaranteed investment contracts, which back up many employee retirement plans, are not covered. There are serious questions about the capacity of this multi-state system to handle major insolvencies. A report in March of 1990 by IDS Financial Services concluded that the insolvency of one or more major insurers conceivably could lead to the collapse of the state guarantee system by exceeding its current administrative and financial capacity to deal with large losses. Capacity is certainly a problem, but timeliness is another. 
While the guarantee funds may ultimately protect many policyholders, executive life annuities have already been cut. What comfort is that to tell Olga Pegalo that she will get the difference down the road but must live for a reduced benefit for a long time to come? There may also be cases where a guarantee fund should not be the entity to pay. For example, Executive Life was often chosen as the annuity provider by corporate raiders who terminated a company's pension plan to rake off the excess cash. Executive Life was chosen because it was the cheapest annuity provider available and thus left the raider the most excess cash. In these cases of outrageous greed, should the life insurance industry and the taxpayers pay through the guarantee fund or should the raider pay? A more basic question is whether more speculative investment type products should receive the same protection as traditional insurance products. There are arguments on both sides of this question. While insurance companies pay into guarantee funds, it's often the taxpayer who actually pays for insolvencies. In most states, life insurance companies can offset their guarantee fund assessments against their state premium taxes, meaning that taxpayers pay for insolvencies. In addition, assessments can be deducted from income for federal income tax purposes. The recent spate of insurance company problems highlight the importance of guarantee funds. A well-functioning guarantee fund system is important to bolster consumer confidence. It may well be that the federal government has a role to play in helping achieve greater uniformity among the states. The hearing today will examine these issues and I look forward to testimony of our witnesses. Let me at uh, this point express my extreme disappointment and anger over the way this hearing on life insurance guarantee funds has apparently been exploited by many. In discussing this hearing with both the company and the textile workers union, the subcommittee staff had made clear to both and both explicitly agreed that the issue of whether Fieldcrest is responsible for the current pension situation in Fieldcrest Canon was not a subject of the hearing and thus the hearing should not be exploited by either party. Both the company and the union recognized that the hearing was on the adequacy of guarantee funds only and that this subcommittee called for the hearing and again both agreed to this. The union kept its agreement. Unfortunately, it seems that the company has not adhered to this agreement and the issue of the company's responsibility for the pension plan of its employee has been directly raised contrary to explicit understandings of all concerned. Both but it is my view that there is no way the current management can absolve itself of responsibility for the fate of its current employees. Again, this is not the subject of this hearing, and so I would hope that it would not be used in any kind of uh, way other than the intention of this full subcommittee. Mr. McMillan. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The uh, solvency of the insurance industry has long been an issue before the Energy and Commerce Committee and and much has been learned uh, over the past mm. year um, through this subcommittee and through the Oversight Investigations uh, Subcommittee. This uh, subcommittee is now dedicating itself to a series of hearings to develop an understanding of the factors behind the solvency of the insurance industry, the nature of the problems that exist, and to explore possible solutions. On July the 17th, we held a hearing on the impact of on the assets of uh, insurance companies, junk bonds, real estate, mortgages, and other investments made by the life insurance industry, and also about the uh, liability side of, uh, of those companies in terms of the nature of the products that they provide. Given the recent takeover of mutual benefit life, we uh, were able to ask regulators and industry experts about the uh, mutual benefit situation and probable causes and possible uh, solutions to that problem. While many agree that the insurance industry is sound overall, and I think we should emphasize that, mutual benefit seems to indicate that a crisis of confidence on the part of policyholders can develop, uh, which can undermine otherwise sound insurers. The credibility of the insurance industry needs to be restored both in substance and in perception. While problems in our state guarantee funds must be addressed, they are but one aspect of the larger insolvency equation because state, state guarantee funds are in fact dependent upon the financial strength of the life insurance industry as a whole. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners has developed 
uh, financial regulation standards which uh, and are working with states to bring them into compliance with the NAIC solvency accreditation program. To date, only four states have been accredited. This year, 33 states have approved laws and regulations contained in the NAIC's solvency certification program in an attempt to qualify for accreditation by the NAIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, I should say. Another 12 states have solvency legislation pending. For some, however, strengthening the current state insurance solvency standards may not go far enough. Chairman Dingell has made it known that insurance solvency legislation is one of his legislative priorities. He is expected to introduce such federal solvency legislation in the next several months. The recent seizures of executive life and mutual benefit have heightened awareness of the guarantee fund system, its potential strengths and its potential weaknesses. Many individuals who bought life insurance policies and annuities from these companies can no longer redeem their policies or seek loans against the cash value of those policies. Payouts to executive life annuity holders have been cut by 30 percent and no payments are being made on guaranteed investment contracts by that company. Such deficiencies have justifiably weakened policyholders' confidence in the safety and soundness of the insurance industry. I'm encouraged that the governor of New Jersey has recently signed uh, life insurance guarantee fund legislation uh, and that a life insurance guarantee fund bill awaits the Louisiana governor's signature. With that signature, all 50 states will have life insurance guarantee funds in place, leaving only the District of Columbia as the only jurisdiction without some sort of coverage. Today's witnesses include individuals who are victims of the inadequacies of the system and insurance industry experts who will hopefully suggest potential solutions to any deficiencies existing in the state guarantee fund system. I wish to welcome all of our witnesses today, and I especially want to uh, extend my welcome to Thelma Honeycutt uh, from Kannapolis, North Carolina, which is right adjacent to uh, my district. And she's worked for uh, Cannon Mills, now Fieldcrest Cannon, for 39 years. Her husband works for uh, Cannon Fieldcrest, and she's one of many employees whose pensions have been affected by the, um, the uh, insolvency of executive life and by the seizure of executive life. I hope that today's hearings will give us added insight into the problems facing uh, Mrs. Honeycutt and others, and that possible solutions will develop over the course of our hearings. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses as we carefully address this most important issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Just to say, Madam Chairman, that I commend Dr. you. I commend you for this uh, hearing, which focuses attention on the difficulties that policyholders have when uh, insurance companies uh, become insolvent. How well is the state mechanisms working to address this? Uh, how much coordination is there between the states? How long does it uh, take the policyholder to be made whole again, if ever? Uh, certainly many different uh, questions that need to be answered, and I hope that we find some of those answers today, and I do commend you for this hearing. Thank you. Mr. Oxley? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and I, too, uh, commend you for uh, this hearing and for an opportunity to uh, hear from uh, some folks who have uh, suffered under the uh, current system. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, the uh, New York Times uh, article of June 24 uh, perhaps sets the stage for this series of hearings. That it reads, life insurers' failures show shortcomings of safety nets. The recent collapse of two huge Los Angeles-based life insurers present a sobering reality to regulators and consumers. The safety program set up by 48 states to protect policyholders when their insurance companies fail may be woefully unprepared for a crisis of this magnitude. Clearly that, uh, I think, uh, points out the uh, need for uh, uh, the uh, set of hearings that we're going to have and the ultimate legislation being drafted by the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Dingell. Uh, when uh, we see uh, uh, the uh, failures of some of these large uh, systems and its effect on real people, uh, it clearly calls uh, into a question the adequacy of these programs. 
and uh, the state's uh, administration of those. And so I look forward to our uh, hearing today uh, for an educational uh, effort uh, on behalf of all of the members to fully understand uh, the crisis before us and to deal with it in a, a very uh, dispassionate and, uh, and workmanlike manner uh, so that we can uh, further uh, uh, make certain that uh, consumers are protected uh, down the line. And I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Bruce. I, I thank the chairman for having this hearing. In 1971, the state of Illinois uh, uh, came across the same problem with insolvency. And I was the author of the legislation to create the Illinois uh, Guarantee Fund, uh, which was in, signed by Governor Ogilvie. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, two, two decades uh, uh, later, we're now taking a look at that program. It's time for review. 49 states have it where that's going to be an adequate uh, dam against the problems we face in the industry, I think, are yet uh, to be made clear. And so I look forward to the hearings to find out whether the state guarantee program needs some sort of backstop with a, a federal program to make sure that every policyholder in this country uh, is covered. Uh, in my own district, the, the failure of the mutual benefit program is affecting uh, 1,900 University of Illinois individuals who thought they were covered and now find that they are not uh, just as recently as a week ago. So these hearings are timely and I appreciate the work of the chairman in this matter. Thank the gentleman. I remind the gentleman too that uh, there are some 2,000 um, employees of the University of, of uh, Illinois at Chicago, which happens to be in my district and uh, has caused a great deal of concern for me, as have, uh, has a great concern uh, been mine because of those people who are annuitants or who have retirement funds uh, in these failed life insurance companies. One such person is Mrs. Olga Pegalo, uh, who's from the city of Chicago, and I became interested in, in seeing her because I read the Chicago Tribune, I believe it was, and found out that uh, she was one of those who was directly affected by executive life. She's one of our witnesses today, and I certainly welcome you, Ms. Pegalo. As a matter of fact, we're going to give our testimony at this time, and you have five minutes to give your um, uh, opening statement with the full knowledge that your entire written statement will be made a part of the record. You may begin at this time. Thank you. Turn it on. Thank you, Chairman Woman Collins and members of the subcommittee. I think I'll show you this first. Should never have happened. Never. What does it say? I can't, I, I can't see that from here. What does it say? It says retirement nest eggs turn to junk. Mm. It was in the Tribune Sunday, May the 19th. I had the privilege to work for a company that allowed me to put money aside for my retirement. Having lived through the depression, I always thought about my security in my older years. I trusted my insurance agent to advise me when I retired at 70 years. I had no knowledge of junk bonds and in 1985, I thought insurance companies were solid. I now know that executive life was already known for bad investments since 1984. Since April 1991, I am only receiving 70% of my check, while 30% is being withheld from each monthly payment and credited to my account with accrued interest. But you know, I don't believe them. Any day I expect to get a notice that executive life is bankrupt. I know the State Department of Insurance in Springfield, Illinois is one of the 48 states that belongs to a guarantee fund. But I need my income now, as do all of us in my generation. We elect our representatives and expect them mm. to do their job to protect us. Where has everybody been since 1984? Since I've written that statement, I have a few things to add. I thought an annuity was a wonderful thing. I had a friend who collected for 25 years, a very dear friend. So I knew that it was good. I selected executive life because 
At 70, I did not know how long I was going to live. My granddaughter studies piano, and I'm kind of like a sponsor for her. And I wanted her to have what was ever left. I don't know, and I hope that all of you young people will realize that this will affect all of you. And that's why I'm here. I'm not only talking for our generation, I'm talking for your generation. I thank you for letting me come to speak to you. Mrs. Honeycutt? I have one question. Oh, I'm sorry. Proceed. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, and all my pension, and my uh, executive life insurance company, when I received my payment every month, from the day I received it, my IRS payment was paid every month. I want to be sure that the government always got my share of the money. And I've done that all my life. I just hope that you will be able to ensure the future for our young people. Thank you for listening to me. Mrs. Honeycutt. I'm Honeycutt. And I'm 57 years old and I'm a weaver in Fieldcrest Cannon in Kannapolis, North Carolina. I can't hear you. Would you turn, push the button maybe, or pull it closer to you? Now, I think you're on. Okay. okay. I'm Thelma Honeycutt, and I'm 57 years old, and I'm a weaver in Fieldcrest, Cannon, Kannapolis, North Carolina. I have worked there for 39 years. First, most of this 39 year of the company was Cannon Mills, but in early 1986, it was sold to Fieldcrest Mills. The company is now Fieldcrest Cannon. My husband also works for the company, mm. and my mother-in-law retired from the mill company mm. about 14 years ago. I have a brother-in-law that retired from there, and I am one of 14 children. I have eight brothers and five sisters, and all of us at some time are either working for the company now or at some time another. Canon was always and still is the biggest employer in our area. Many generations of the same family have worked for it there. We had a good retirement plan before it was stopped by David Murdoch in 1985. We were all told in writing that our pension would be protected and we would be paid. We were told we would get whatever was our, we had coming and that our benefits were saved. It took a long time before I ever got anything telling me what I would get. The new owner of the company, Phil Crest, tried to even get information for us, but it was a long time before we got any papers. I finally got this certificate tell me that I would get $111.31 a month at my normal retirement day. Executive life was mentioned in this certificate. By the time, I don't think anyone knew anything about them. Then beginning this year, we began hearing all about their problems, and the pensions were all of a sudden cut 30%. I am well aware of this impact because my mother-in-law, who doesn't get very much to start with, was worried about having to take out her telephone or give up something else because she didn't have the money. I've worked hard all my life, and so have my friends and co-workers. Now that I should be thinking about retirement, I'm worried that this annuity is worthless. Is anyone trying to, uh, anyone trying to retire early now or collect from this cannot even file? We're told no early retirees. What am I supposed to do? I've always felt that pensions were safe and there was nothing to worry about. Working people should not have to worry about this. It's wrong and it's not fair. Who is supposed to be looking out after us? The new paper have told us that there is a guarantee fund set up to make up the difference, but they haven't. How long will it take before someone does something? I know Phil Crest has talked to the Guarantee Association and to the North Carolina Commission of Insurance, but nothing has been done. I'm worried and my friends are worried. If I lost my job or had to retire early, what do I do? What do I live on? We're only asking for what is ours. I don't blame Phil Crest. They didn't do this, and I haven't been able to get anyone else to help us. For all of us still working, please do something to help us so that we don't spend all our time worrying about what, whether we're going to have anything when we retire. 
But most of all, I hope that you will do something for the people that are struggling to live on 30% less. Thank you. Mrs. Pegalo, how did you happen uh, to uh, get exec choose Executive Life as a place for an annuity? When I retired, I received the lump sum from the company that I retired. And the insurance agent was, he's not connected with the company, but he was recommended to me. And when he came to my home, uh, we looked over the different policies. And like I stated before, knowing the experience with an annuity by my friend, I, I thought it was a very good investment. And because of my age and because of my sponsorship for my grand granddaughter, I wanted to be sure that if anything happened to me and that uh, the payments would continue to her. And this was one company that did, did do that. So that's why I selected Executive Life, so that uh, I knew that if I lived out my term, fine, and if not, uh, Carrie would uh, benefit by it. Did you by any chance check with Illinois officials to see whether your annuity was covered by the guarantee fund? No, I didn't. I didn't know anything about anything like that. I, I guess I was naive and I just thought that uh, I just recently learned that the uh, state of Illinois was one of the states that had this guarantee fund. So you bought the, uh, the annuity because you wanted to have uh, coverage for your, your granddaughter's piano lessons and you chose an annuity because you felt that the, the money that you put into it would be protected. Correct. Because your friend had, this, had had an annuity for 25 years. Correct. This is quite a few years ago that this uh, friend of mine had that annuity, so I never doubted anything about an insurance company. So I never had any experience that any of them ever failed until this day. Now, however, you find that your, your checks are 30% are less Correct. than what you had thought they were going to be. And now that this has happened, how do you feel about that? I, I feel very badly because with inflation, and I'm not working and have no chance of going back to work, uh, my income is cut, and I'm, I have bills to pay that I have to cover, and it's, it's been a loss to me. Now, the guarantee fund doesn't, uh, hasn't triggered yet, even though Illinois has one. And uh, you're going to have to wait a while to make up the difference. Has anybody told you how long you're going to have to wait? I have no idea how they will ever, how this will all work. I don't know how to proceed even to uh, get to the state of Illinois to find out how I would be protected by them. So one know. of the things you would say that, that many uh, uh, holders of these insurance annuities and other pension benefits, et cetera, would need to know is, is how to go about exactly. in fact, getting the information that they need. That's correct. From I, the insurance company or from somebody. That's correct. I have no inf information on how to go about collecting the 30% that I'm supposed to be guaranteed by the state of Illinois. Now you mentioned that you have income tax taken out of your, uh, out of your, out of your annuity. Yes. For the purpose of paying the federal government whatever it happens to, to need out of that. Correct. Because <laughs> that's the way they get it. They take out what they want, don't they? That's right. <laughs> That's for doggone sure. Now, your concern, I, I gather then, is since the company has gone belly up, will that money that you've already not seen on your check show up at IRS so that you're covered when your tax is due in, uh, for this year? I have no idea if they paid my income tax but to the IRS the past five years. I have received a statement from them that that money has been paid but I don't know. I really don't know. Every year I file, that has gone to the IRS showing that I paid that amount to the IRS. But you know, I don't know how long it'll take the IRS to catch up with the uh, executive life to find out whether that money has really been paid. So then if it hasn't been paid, you stand to have an even greater loss. That's correct. Then we'll, uh, the IRS will certainly will come to my door and ring my bell and say, you owe me, or you owe the government, when in reality, I was thinking all the time I had paid the government. 
Mrs. Honeycutt, we know you're not a lawyer. You're a victim of your situation. You said that, um, you know, Phil Crest is to blame and they didn't do this. And I'm sure that's, that's the case, that perhaps they did not do this. But there uh, seems to be a situation there where uh, you feel uncertain about what your pension is going to be when you do decide to retire. And I think that uh, I want you to express that concern to me like and to the subcommittee. In, say, five years, I'll be 62, and in seven years, 65. When I get ready for that retirement, is this money going to be available for me to plan my income, or am I going to have to bank around another uh, area for that? I'm sorry, I was listening to, to uh, counsel. Well, I said in five years I'll be 62, and in seven I'll be 65. And is this annuity going to be available for me then, or should I start planning now for something else to help me in my retirement? Let me ask you a question. Why do you feel that, that field crest that you work for is not responsible, I think you made that in your opening statement, is not responsible for the pension situation at this time? Well, this occurred before they took over, is the way I feel. And uh, they really did not know and have anything to do with this money. They didn't get any of this money. David Murdoch and the executive life got all this money. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, David Murdoch and executive life got all that money that Cannon Mills has set aside for us, not uh, Phil Chris Cannon. But well, since you're still working, the cuts in executive life annuities haven't affected you directly. No, not, but my mother-in-law, which I help look after, has been directly affected by it because uh, she lives by herself and her retirement's not that much and then this $50 she had been getting, I mean, it meant a lot to her and then when it was cut down to 35, that meant, am I gonna have a light, I mean, water bill money or telephone money or grocery money? Those are certainly some very major concerns. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, um, thank you again for coming up and testifying. Um, Ms. Honeycutt, um, are you, um, if you don't mind me asking just a few uh, not too personal questions, are you totally dependent upon your retirement plan for your retirement security now or see, do you have I any? I have a plan through Phil Crest Cannon that I put into myself. I put a percentage of my salary into it myself. But like I said, this was set aside for me and I feel like it's mine. Well, sure it is. Um, did you, um, what was the amount of your contributions? Uh, this one now is in uh, concern here. We didn't put anything in it. Kenny Mills put it all in there for us. I see. They but you had savings in addition to that, you said. Oh, yes, I have a, a form through Phil Crest Cannon where it's uh, KO 401. KO 401. Uh, and so you could make those contributions, and those contributions would be tax deductible. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. I put that out of my own salary myself. I set that aside each two weeks. Do you, uh, do you own your own home? Yes, sir. Did you acquire that from uh, My Canada? mother recently died, and I acquired it through being left to me. I see. I think some time back they, they, they built a lot of um, housing, and then at some point they sold that to the employees. Is that no, right? I have a home belonged to my family for all my life. Right. Um, I, I, I guess it wouldn't be, um, <clears throat> you probably wouldn't recall what you had, uh, what the company had put into the pension plan over your working life, but have you received uh, communications from the company over your working life as to what contribution they were making? Was that part of your uh, no, annual you um, statement from the, the company? The new one or the old one? Both. Now, the new one with Bill Crest, we get a statement every quarter telling us how much we've got in it and the interest it's made and all. But the, this Cannon, see, it was a, what they call a divine retirement program. We didn't know because Cannon Mills put all that money in. It was a, based on what you made, and they put a percentage into this trust fund for us. So we had no idea. All we were told, if you had over $2,500 in this account, you could not draw it out that it would be uh, put into annuity for us. Well, what was your feeling about the, the, um, the, the uh, sufficiency of that pension plan to meet the 
um, obligations that you felt the company had made to you? The old one or the new one? The old one and then the new one. Well, I feel like my new one, it's up to me to determine whether I will put a large sum in it or a small sum in it because I know the cost of living goes up every day. But it's up to me to start to make plans for it and not depend solely on this. But like the old one, that was something the company was giving us as, sorry, I think as a pension for working for them and giving them our years of service. Well, when that was changed, when they substituted an annuity, <clears throat> for uh, that pension obligation. Well, Did you have any concern at that time? Uh, I thought the money should have been given me if I wanted to, to put where I wanted to instead of it put it somewhere where I didn't even know something about. Mm -hmm. I think each individual should have been consulted and asked, do you want to draw your money out and put it into a savings for yourself? Did you have that? You didn't have that no, option. No, sir. We were not given the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, was, was it discussed among employees at that time as, as to whether or not that should be an option? Or? A lot of people thought they ought to be able to draw their money out instead of, uh, you know, him putting it, Mr. Murdoch putting it where he wanted to put it. Uh -huh. um, insofar as you know, did the company's annual report, the audit of the company's uh, annual report, have any comments with respect to the adequacy of the pension plan? I cannot remember. Okay. Um, Did you, did you have any feeling that the substitution of an annuity for the old Canon uh, pension plan posed a greater risk to your long-term financial security? Well, I've asked ever since day one different people, is this paper going to mean anything to me when I get old enough to retire? Because I really did not have faith in a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you were right. <laughs> Let me ask you another question, which gets to the remedy. Um, you mentioned in your testimony that, that, that you've read in the newspapers that the North Carolina Guarantee Fund would make up the difference. Is that, is, is the newspaper the only place that you've... Um, That's I had talked to someone in the middle and I asked them, I said, what are they going to do about this? And then they began telling us about this guaranteed, uh, and I said, well, you're talking over my head because I'm not an insurance person. But they said, in other words, they're going to try to get it where we can be covered for the loss. But I said, well, how long is it going to take? And they said, well, they couldn't tell us that. But I had read a little bit of it in the newspaper, especially I get firsthand out of Charlotte Serve out of Concord, uh, Charlotte. And that's where we found out where Life Executive was in trouble. And then we called about it. And they said, no, no, it's not in trouble as far as we know. This was a year ago. On, um, do you have a file of, of your records with the uh, correspondence from the pension plan, the old one, the new one, from Executive Life? I have just this one thing. That's all I've got. Just that one thing. Have you written the uh, North Carolina um, Insurance Commissioner uh, with respect to the obligations of the guarantee fund to you and other Canon Fieldcrest employees? No, sir, I have not. Would you do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the problems I think we're facing here is, number one, is under the respective states, do the guarantee funds cover annuities? And I think some do and some don't. And I'm not going to try to um, state a legal opinion. I'm not a lawyer, number one, thank goodness. But um, but I think that's an inquiry that you should make and an entitled to an answer, and I would expect that you would get an, an answer on that. The, the other aspect of it is, though, um, the fact that we've got a, a situation out here with an executive life where legal decisions have not yet been made that free up anybody's, whether it's a guarantee fund or the company itself, with respect to honoring those. And that presents another problem because you you hesitate to disrupt what is a normal legal process, and yet you're not yet in a bind because you're not yet retired. Uh, but you are, and, and, um, and there's a concern about that um, breakdown because we all know how long uh, the legal resolution of some of these things may take. Well, my time has expired, but I want to thank you both again for taking your time to come up and uh, make us aware of your
your concerns. May yes, I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. I know there is a guarantee fund in 48 states, but in that guarantee fund, is the money there? Well, that's another question. In most cases, is it is a guarantee. But the money not is fund. not there. The money has to first be collected. Well, but that means that, um, that those, uh, those who participate in that state in the sale of insurance are obligated to pay into the fund. In other so. words, all the other insurance companies that are solvent in that state will have to donate the money or pay the money to this guarantee fund. It isn't like the FDIC where the money is there. I wish it were. Right. So there is that difference. Um, there is a guarantee fund. Well, but those there is those no money. also those also are based on guarantees too. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is. But the government really is behind be the FDIC. It, the reason why the, the taxpayers having to pay off S and L deposits is because the fund wasn't adequate to meet the uh, correct the guarantee of the uh, of the deposits. Yes, and so this is the same problem with the insurance company. Well, the you, money isn't you there. You obviously make a very valid point. The guarantee <laughs> is there, but not the money. <laughs> Sir, yes, where would I get the address to write to this guarantee? I'll have it to you before um, you leave the room. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Rowland. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. I'm somewhat oh, reluctant. Oh, oh. Please stay at the table. <laughs> go now. <laughs> I'm somewhat reluctant to get involved in this discussion because I fear I may be grilled. <laughs> about, uh, this is really a switch, but uh, maybe we'll get something uh, beneficial out of this. I thank both of you very much for coming. I know it is not easy to come and discuss in public uh, something that is very personal to you, as you, you have done. And I commend you for that, and I know that you are concerned not only for yourself, as you have already stated, but also for other generations. That there needs to be something done to ensure that the trust which you have placed in, in these companies is in fact valid. Let me ask uh, you, Ms. Pegolo, um, you said that you withdrew a lump sum from your company at the time right. of your retirement. Did your company have some sort of retirement plan that you could have left the money with? My company had a pension plan. I, get a co I do get a pension from my company. This was something extra that my company allowed me to do to put a certain amount of my paycheck away uh, every month so that I could increase my income when I retired. So that was a savings plan that really, was that, uh, more uh, that, or less. You, that yes, you had. And then you had this lump sum payment that you would be able to invest to supplement yes. the pension plan and Social Security, I suppose, to, yes. to, uh, to be sure that you had uh, the kind of security that you wanted Correct. Uh, at the time that, that, that you retired. What sort of guarantees, if any, were made to you at the time that you purchased this annuity. Did, were any sort of oral guarantees yes. made to you? I was guaranteed a payment for 10 years. And that was an oral? No, it's on uh, my... That is written on, into the contract. It's, it's it on, my, on my contract. On your contract. 10 years or whatever. The, that all depended on the interest that it accumulated, I guess, if it would last longer than 10 years. And being that I was 70 years of age, I you know, I thought to myself, well, something could happen, within, can happen any time, but after 70, you're thankful for every day that you get. Yeah, I think so, that's right. After you're 65, you're thankful, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was yeah. lucky, but I worked until I was 70. Very good. I worked till I was 70. Let me ask you, you said that you, you uh, purchased this annuity from a friend, or through a friend. No, no. No. No, no, through an insurance agent. I see the insurance agent was not a friend then. Well, apparently, the insurance agent was I not a friend. I don't think he was. <laughs> <laughs> I know I won't say that. I won't say that. No, he was a very nice gentleman. That. Uh, but it was not someone you had known for a long time. Well, I knew him through our company. That he was had dealings with other uh, people in our company. Well, that was going to be the next question. Did, do you know of other people that also? Oh yes, there are other people in this company that have executive life. Uh, 
I don't know if they have annuities or what they have, but this is all done personally for us. It is not the company that suggested it. It's our own personal choice, but because we have an insurance agent, we discuss it with him. Like I go to a doctor, the doctor should know what to do. That's why I think an insurance agent should know what he's doing too. And uh, the, the uh, agent, of course, got a commission for the annuity which he sold you. Pardon? The, uh, the agent got a commission uh, for the annuity which he sold you, I assume. Well, yes. All right. Was this enough uh, as you contemplated that what you would get from your pension plus what you would get from this annuity plus Social Security would be enough for you to retire comfortably? Yes. And you would be able to do the things that you wanted to do with reference to your granddaughter and... Yes, yes. But now that is not the case. Well, I am one of the fortunate people that I am not absolutely dependent on executive life, thank God. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to say, sit here and tell you that that's my, that it will ruin my life. It's just that I will have to <coughs> do some things that I can't do, you know. Everything is going up today. My taxes are going up. My property tax goes up. My telephone bills go up, my electric goes up, my gas goes up, my food bills go up, everything. So you're not going to be quite as comfortable as you thought that you were going to be because of this? Right. Correct. Okay. Well, I, again, I, I, I thought, do you have something else you want to say? No. <laughs> I guess I said, <laughs> I think I've said enough. <laughs> I'm going to, well, I'm going to stop right now before you ask me a question. And, uh, <laughs> again, thank, I thank both of you very much for coming. Thank you, madam. Let me, too, thank both of you for appearing before us this morning. Your testimony has been very, very helpful. I know that you, Mrs. Pegalo, plan to uh, get back to Chicago uh, right away, and so you can be excused at this time if you'd like to be. Ms. Honeycutt, thank you, too, for coming before us. Your testimony has been equally good, and we do appreciate it. And now we're ready for our next panel. Thank you. Next panel will be the Honorable Bert J. McKaysey, who's a commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Mr. Eden S. Sarfati. Sarfati. He's the president of the National Organization of Life and Health Insurance Guarantee Associations. And Ms. Marcia Horton, who's vice president and director of government relations for Lincoln National Life Insurance Company. Mr. McKaysey, we're going to begin with you. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members, for inviting me here today. I'm the Commerce Commissioner of Minnesota, and as such, I'm responsible for the regulation of insurance. I'd like to thank uh, Richard Huberman and your staff, uh, Madam Chair and members, for the courtesies that they have shown me in arranging this. Some gremlins uh, intercepted the 50 copies of my statement that were supposed to be on the table. They, uh, they may arrive uh, before we adjourn today, and I hope they do. Recently, I triggered Minnesota's Guarantee Association in response to the impaired condition of Midwest Life Insurance Company of Louisiana. And in the next five minutes, I'll describe briefly how our association operates and how the process worked in the case of Midwest. The association in Minnesota was established by the legislature in 1977 it's basically the state's safety net to protect Minnesota policyholders. Up to certain limits, the association will pay claims and benefits not paid by a company that is impaired or insolvent. However, as one of the previous witnesses pointed out, it's not a fund like the FDIC, and it raises revenue only when needed. It raises revenues by assessing insurance companies licensed to do business in Minnesota. There's a maximum assessment in Minnesota of 2% of each company's premium written the prior year. In 1991, the assessment would raise a maximum of $56 million for annuity holders, $20 million for life policy holders, and $27 million for accident and health policy holders. The assessments are made when a company is declared, uh, number one, either insolvent and under a court-ordered supervision or secondly, if the Commerce Commissioner finds that it is impaired, 
and that is when a company is not able to meet its contract obligations, as happened in the Midwest Life situation. At that point, our association then contacts the policyholders and tells them how to go about receiving their payments. And this is a process that is currently underway in Minnesota. As to Midwest, we had been keeping an eye on them for some time. Early in 1990, the Commerce Department took appropriate action to protect Minnesota policyholders. Uh, state law prohibits disclosing the exact nature of our action, but I can tell you that in 1989, hardly any business was written by Midwest in Minnesota, and in 1990, zero was written. On April 11th of this year, uh, the Louisiana regulators put the company in conservation, and then on June 26th, they put it in rehabilitation, and by the terms of that court order, all payments to policyholders in Minnesota ceased, period. We had 1,230 annuity holders, some of them receiving monthly checks. We have 17 life insurance holders. The total value of uh, the holdings of these people is about $33 million, and it's about 40% of Midwest's national business. Under the terms of the court order, uh, the policyholders would receive no more benefits, and it was clear to me that, that under the terms of the Minnesota statute, the company could not meet its contract obligations. So the following day, on June 27th, uh, I declared Midwest impaired. We were the first state in the nation to do that. Uh, by declaring them impaired, it, it de facto activated the Minnesota Guarantee Fund. By August 1st, our Guarantee Association should be paying monthly annuity checks to the Minnesota annuitants. Uh, by mid-August, the association will have completed its assessment and collection of funds from the industry. And by September 1st, the Guarantee Association should be paying death benefits and honoring approximately $9 million worth of requests to cash in policies. However, I have imposed a temporary moratorium on surrenders that were requested July 3rd or later. And the purpose of this moratorium was really to enable us to look ahead. I think we have to be prudent about using the $56 million in capacity that is available in 1991 for annuity contracts, and we have eight other companies that have been seized to consider, and their futures are uncertain. If additional impairments happen this year, we need to have room in our guarantee fund to deal with them. So it definitely involves a balancing act of, of the known needs and the possible future needs. The moratorium in Minnesota will expire on October 1st, and if there are no additional impairments, it's my intention at that time to lift the moratorium. Our goal at that point would be to use the 1991 assessment capacity to take care of the remaining liabilities of the Midwest policyholders. I walked through the highlights of the Mid Midwest timetable, which shows how our process works. We have uh, expedited the process for Midwest policyholders in Minnesota, and I'm proud to say that the Guarantee Association payments will be going out to annuitants approximately one month after we declared impairment. Normally, it probably takes about three months to crank up this machinery, but we did shorten the process. Uh, back in April, when we, we suspected possible trouble, we started asking the company for information necessary to make assessments. And this put us in a position to start the assessment process quickly. Next year, we plan to require all insurers to provide assessment information with their annual financial statements. So the information will then be ready and at hand, so we'll be able to respond to any future impairments efficiently and timely. Madam Chair and members, uh, that is the extent of my formal remarks. Thank you. Mr. Safety. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. My name is Eden Sarfati. I'm president of the National Organization of Life and Health Insurance Guarantee Associations, NOLGA. NOLGA was formed in 1983 as the last substantial life insurer insolvency. Baldwin United began to unfold. NOLGA is the national arm of the State Life and Health Insurance Guarantee Association system. We provide operational, informational, and analytical assistance to our members. 
Our principal function and mission is to harness the capabilities of our member state associations to enable us to function as a national system, able to respond effectively and efficiently to multi-state and national problems while preserving the independent authority and responsiveness of the individual states and minimizing the insular and bureaucratic tendencies of large unitary agencies. The current situation comprising insolvencies and impairments unprecedented in number and dimension will test our ability to perform this mission in the future. The situation, I believe, will also test whether state insurance regulators and their state rehabilitators and liquidators are capable of recognizing that the Guarantee Association system cannot perform adequately in the current environment unless they recognize that its authority must be commensurate with its responsibility and recognize its needs for timely information. The guarantee system, I believe, is adequate to the current situation, but it is certainly not perfect. And I would say that its biggest problems are insufficient administrative resources, which must come from our members, and inadequate cooperation and information from state regulators. Fixing these problems probably does not require legislation, either federal or state, but rather a recognition of new realities and the time and attention of those responsible to address it. <clears throat> the guarantee associations are created by state law to protect policyholders, insureds, beneficiaries, annuitants, payees, and assignees against losses, both in terms of paying claims and in terms of continuing coverage, which might otherwise occur due to the impairment or insolvency of a life or health insurance company, a member of the respective associations. The purpose of the guarantee associations is to fully guarantee the reasonable expectations of the vast majority of individual policy and group insurance certificate holders within the limits of the state laws. Their purpose is not to underwrite any and all promises, no matter how large or reckless. Moreover, the NAIC Model Act and many state statutes have now re-emphasized that it is individuals to whom insurers have made promises that the guarantee associations exist to protect, not employers or other group contract holders in their own right. I was, uh, I was a little taken aback by the comment uh, from the dais earlier that uh, the prior witnesses uh, were victims in some regard uh, of the system and certainly they are victims of an unfortunate situation and I would say it's uh, clearly fair to say uh, the victims of imprudent investment practices conducted by one insurance company. Uh, however, it appears to me uh, that they will be the beneficiaries of the guarantee system. Uh, while I cannot address uh, with any certainty their specific cases at the current time. Uh, from what they have told me and from what I've heard, I would be surprised uh, if when the time comes uh, that their contracts with Executive Life are not fully covered by the Guarantee Association. Uh, they are the very type of people holding the very type of paper whom the Guarantee Associations exist principally to protect uh, and we will do that. Life and health insurance guarantee associations cover most life insurance policies, health insurance policies, and annuities, and the vast majority of the insurance buying public. With the enactment of guarantee association statutes in New Jersey uh, and uh, uh, just about in Louisiana, uh, it will be very soon, I believe, that we can say that no matter where you live in the United States, if you have a life insurance contract, an annuity contract, or health insurance written by an insurance company, you will be entitled to at least $100,000 of protection for any guarantee that the insurer has made to you. Now, the California law does contain an unusual 20% offset limitation. Uh, it is the only one directly of that, of that kind, uh, and uh, it also has dollar limitations. 
But the remarkable thing is, not that this is uh, a system of inconsistent coverages, but that it is a system of remarkably uniform coverages throughout the entire country. For the vast majority of people, they can be assured that their contracts will be covered. Mm -hmm. What is not covered is where the insurance company has not made you a promise. If you have bought a variable contract where you have accepted the risk, a variable annuity, a variable life insurance contract, where you are taking the gamble as an investor that if, if the investment values behind the contract go up, you do better, but if they go down, you do worse, then the Guarantee Association is not going to provide an external guarantee for a risk that you undertook. The time of the gentleman has expired. I'm pretty sure there are other thoughts you want to make. It'll come out during the question and answer Be session. Ms. Horton? <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Marsha Horton, and I'm Vice President and Director of Government Relations for Lincoln National Life Insurance Company. Um, I have served on various state guarantee association boards since 1983. Uh, I, my, I am here today on behalf of the American Council of Life Insurance, and my written statement has been submitted. For purposes of my oral testimony, I would prefer to just summarize and focus on two areas which I believe are of very general concern, and that is the issue of capacity and the issue of prompt payment and timeliness of Guarantee Association response. Um, Guarantee Associations generally have been described uh, previously, and as Mr. McMillan noted, the, with the exception of Louisiana, all states have uh, laws currently in place we have no reason to believe that the Louisiana law will not go into effect. And furthermore, we also uh, believe that it's extremely important that the District of Columbia have in place a guarantee association for the protection of the residents of the district. Before 1985, we operated under a system where the state of domicile of an insurance company, if it had a guarantee association, was responsible for all of the policyholder obligations regardless of where those policyholders resided that put a tremendous strain on the state guarantee fund system because the premium volume in one state had to provide sufficient assessment capacity to pay all policyholder obligations that became readily apparent to us when Baldwin United became insolvent and as a result um, the industry uh, acted in a way to encourage states to change the system by promoting a structure where the state would each state would be responsible only for their residents by doing that and also by encouraging adoption of guarantee association laws in all states we believe that capacity has significantly increased because now the premium volume, which is the basis of assessments in each individual state, is available solely for the residents of that particular state, and we believe this is very beneficial. As a result, based upon uh, information that we have received from NOLGA, the total aggregate annual capacity overall um, is three. $3.06 billion. Of this, $1.09 billion is um, attributable for life insurance and $784 million is allowable for annuities. We believe this capacity is adequate for several reasons. First of all, Guarantee Association assessments are not the sole source of funds to help make policyholders whole. 
it assumes that there are no assets in the estate of an insolvent company. I will give you an example of how the receiver can use the assets of uh, the estate of an insolvent company with a subsidy from guarantee associations to make the money work very efficiently. It is co very common in most cases where life insurance and annuity products are involved that eventually those blocks of business can be sold to a financially stable company for those people who are not currently on claim. Let us assume for a moment that um, the liability on that block of business is not the face value but rather the reserves which are being held or should be held. Let's assume on a block of business the reserve liability which should have been held is one million dollars. However, the assets available uh, from the estate equal only seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Guarantee associations would make up the difference which would be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so that that business could be sold. So rather than having a liability of one million dollars, the Guarantee Association really would only have to contribute two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that instance. So it makes our money go much further. Also, uh, we assume that all individuals who have annuities and who have uh, life, insurance uh, life insurance policies are going to go on claim immediately on the triggering or the liquidation of an insurance company, and that is certainly not the case. Uh, claims come in and they are paid, and it gives us an opportunity because we have to continue the business to pay on a regular basis. Finally, I'd like to briefly address the issue of prompt payment, which I believe um, has been very well illustrated by uh, Commissioner McKaysey, um, because that has been my experience, that guarantee associations become involved in the information process very early, prior to the time when they become legally obligated. And that is that through the exchange of information, not only with our own commissioner, but also with the receiver, a liquidator in a particular state, we are able to constantly have an idea of um, what our potential liability might be and the timing in which we will need to make the assessment. In doing this planning, this allows us to do preliminary work for assessments, and um, we think that this benefits the policyholder, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. McCasey, I understand that uh, this, your state of Minnesota is the only one that's paying in, out any kind of funds, whatever, on the Midwest uh, uh, failure. Why is that? Well, Madam Chair, um, we will start paying uh, August 1st. Our guarantee fund will. I can't uh, speak for the other states, Madam Chair. All I can tell you is that, uh, that in Minnesota, we have a sense of urgency and, uh, and a great concern for those policyholders. And uh, the day before I declared Midwest impaired, I called in the representatives of the Guarantee Association and said that I was going to do this tomorrow and that I wanted uh, <clears throat> them to know that and that I wanted us to work as a team to do whatever we had to do to get the information and, uh, and get the money flowing. Mr. Sarfati, you said that um, you're concerned about the, the um, about us con calling the previous witnesses victims. Well, I think I might have made that statement. I made it because they are victims to the extent that uh, they're, they're, there's fear in their lives, to the extent that in, in Ms. Uh, uh, Pegalo's case, you know, she said that she took out this policy when she was 70 years old. She's now 75 years old. And you said that they are going to be made whole when the time comes. The question is, when will the time come? For her, who is, for, for the lady who is 75 years old and who <clears throat> made the statement during her testimony, that she doesn't know how long she has to live any more than anybody else. Uh, we, but we, for her to uh, have, I'll finish my question. Sure. Before, uh, you know, she wants some kind of satisfaction of knowing that before perhaps she, she passes, that she is going to enjoy the benefits of this annuity, the money for which that bought it she paid for it during her working years, and I think she should have that kind of confidence that this is going to happen. When the time comes, when will the time come? Well, with respect to that situation, the 30% reduction uh, 
and she uh, pointed out in her testimony that 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 30 percent deduction might not be you know life altering for her but it's going to make some major concerns it, it is and there are others for whom it is life altering exactly uh indeed and uh, uh frankly we thought the time had already come we, we didn't understand why the conservator took that type of action that uh, that that they took in fact uh, we requested that they resume 100 percent they have the cash flow uh, and uh, uh, within and these particular contracts are well within guarantee association limits um, uh, and uh, we requested <coughs> that they that they do that that they uh, uh, they resume those payments there are uh, uh, very many many people involved uh, the uh, uh, types of of contracts which uh, these particular individuals have uh, present relatively simple situations uh, and uh, and frankly, we don't know why uh, that that situation. Okay, so exists. the situation is then that uh, there are times when uh, even though you, as a, a president of the Insurance Guarantee Association, would 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 think that uh, the uh, guarantee funds have already kicked in, they haven't. Mm -hmm. But it shows that this is an illustration of what can happen: that people can have a long period of time before they uh, they're made completely whole all over again. That's the point that I wanted to try to make here because I don't want that to be slid over. Uh, another question that I have <coughs> for um, Mr. Mackesy. Is it Mackesy or Mackesy? It's Mackesy, Madam Chair. Mr. Mackesy, all right. I wanted to get it right. If executive life was declared insolvent tomorrow and put in liquidation, how quickly do you think Minnesota policyholders could be paid off? Well, Madam Chair, I can't, uh, I can't say that with certainty. It, it, would, uh, it would be a much bigger operation than the Midwest. But um, I would hope that, you know, if we're, doing, if we're starting Midwest uh, in a little over 30 days, uh, I would hope that, uh, that we could follow that pattern or closely for executive life if we have to. That would be our goal in any event. What would happen if the Minnesota fund reaches the assessment li limit? Uh, could the fund borrow to pay off policyholders? Well, interestingly enough, Madam Chair, uh, as it stands, not, well, it, it could borrow, but it is not legislatively mandated to do so. But our legislature in its last session passed legislation that would mandate uh, in August of 1992 that the Guarantee Association borrow under those circumstances. Well, under what circumstances would your state law trigger the Guarantee Association assessment when a company is so-called financially impaired rather than insolvent? Or is that the commissioner's discretion? Well, we can trigger under two situations, Madam Chair. One is uh, if a company is insolvent, and of course that declaration would have to be made in its home state. The other option, which I invoked in Midwest, was under the Minnesota law when a company is impaired, which by legal definition in Minnesota means that it cannot meet its contract obligations, uh, then we can trigger. And, and that was clearly the case with Midwest when they said no more payments to anyone. It's a very clear case. When an executive life or a mutual benefit becomes impaired, policyholders nationwide are affected. And I'm just wondering what, in your view, do you think uh, is the role of the federal government in ensuring that all states implement guarantee funds efficiently and fairly? Mr. Mackesy. Well, Madam Chair, if, if the question was uh, should we have a, uh, a federal or national guarantee fund, uh, in my mind, uh, the jury is still out on that. I, I can certainly see uh, the pros and the cons. The pros would be uh, arguably a larger assessment base uh, and some uniformity. Uh, one of the disadvantages in my mind would be that uh, I would much prefer to control the destiny of Minnesota policyholders from Minnesota where we can react rapidly as we did in this particular case. And with all due deference to the federal government, uh, I would be very concerned if, if the the rescue of the Midwest policyholders or any other resided with decisions to be made in Washington because I'm not sure 
how fast they would move, how much pressure would be brought to bear. In Minnesota, uh, we are right there in downtown St. Paul. We have policyholders all around us. We have the Guarantee Association officials. We have insurance officials. We have state legislators. Uh, and there's a lot of interest and a lot of pressure. And all of that sort of comes together uh, to make us function well as regulators. Ms. Horton, do you think we ought to have a federal guarantee fund? <clears throat> I guess my response uh, is sort of twofold. First of all, I would be interested in knowing whether we're speaking about a federal guarantee fund with or without federal funding. Um, if we're talking about a federal guarantee fund without the guarantee or additional federal funding, I'm hard pressed at this point in time to see what the particular benefit or enhancement um, to the current system might be. I personally believe, based upon my experience, that the current system um, at the state level <clears throat> gives us a great deal of flexibility. It has been my experience um, that we do have the opportunity to work with our, take care of our people at the state level. We have the flexibility of coordinating with other state guarantee associations to reduce uh, administrative expenses. So at the present time, I have not quite seen what the additional benefit or value to the current system might be. Mr. McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just uh, pursuing that general line of questioning, um, it, it seems that there, <clears throat> you know, there may be some logic in, in a national guarantee fund if, in fact, it wasn't under federal regulation. In other words, it might well be a compact among the states that would, and its only reason to exist would be to overcome any deficiencies that might exist in, in a, um, <clears throat> the inconsistencies in the state system, or the fact that you've got an executive life in California operating under California rules with uh, annuity, annuitants in Illinois and North Carolina um, one of whom is currently not getting paid that to which she um, felt she was contractually entitled and, and one who has an expectation or there are probably others who are not receiving or only getting 70 percent of, uh, of what they thought they would get. Um, isn't there a way to structure this short of federal money and guarantee, short of uh, of even uh, a federal regulatory scheme that, in effect, uh, um, through common agreement among the states, all of whom, as uh, within a short period of time, will have, will have guaranteed funds, which I assume are fairly consistent. I don't know that. That's another whole issue. Um, but would that serve a useful purpose in, in dealing with some of the problems that have been raised here today, and that is delay in payments? A delay in a decision-making process which should, could be overcome by a fund uh, as opposed to a, an obligation, an unsettled mm -hmm. obligation, um, that might deal with the issue of credibility which we've all raised here. What are people to believe about uh, the validity of their contracts? So if, if, if you could comment on the advantages of that, I'd, or disadvantages, I would like to hear it. Um, uh, Mr. McMillan, uh, the idea of an interstate compact on use uh, in connection possibly with guarantee associations, um, state regulation generally, is currently under study by an ACLI um, study group of which I am a member, and uh, we have not yet arrived at any conclusion, but we currently are examining this concept because mm -hmm. I, I assure you that we also share the concern because we are affected on a daily basis by the shake in public confidence in our industry because whenever something happens at, at, to a company and we, our policyholders and customers read about it in the press, we're inundated by phone calls and questions at the home office and through our agents. So obviously we're very, we, we share your, your concern and we are looking at that. Um, I would make one observation as far as the issue of delay in payment. Um, I'm not sure at this time, but I haven't given it a great deal of thought, whether even an interstate compact uh, focusing on guarantee associations would, in fact, um, really assist in that problem. Uh, the, the, 
the, because of the way companies are liquidated and uh, those proceedings and the way guarantee associations relate, that may not necessarily result in faster payment. Um, the whole system, one of the difficulties we have is we currently have a very delicate balance. Uh, where under the, the State Guarantee Association system, if we are triggered or pay out too much too soon, um, those funds are coming from solvent insurers, whether paid prior to an insolvency or whether after an insolvency, and the money comes from someplace and it well, comes from our surplus. The question then becomes whether or not the guarantee fund is in effect going to bank the obligation, and then it assumes a responsibility mm -hmm. for recovering from the insurance company's assets, whatever right. it can, but its obligation is either to meet the terms of the contract or not. That is or, true. Or conditionally to meet the terms of the contract. I mean, I think that's, that that's is, the issue of confidence that we're really talking about. That is here. true. And sometimes it is very difficult to assess uh, at, a, at a very early stage in a conservation proceeding the extent to which we actually have liabilities because uh, during the process, the records are being compiled and sometimes they're not either non-existent or very incomplete and it is very difficult to get a handle on what the actual liability is. Well, I'm glad to hear that there is a, a study going on about the compact approach because I think it not only has potential validity for uh, guarantee funds, but it has potential validity in terms of common standards and, and practices that doesn't take away any power of the state regulator, as I see it, it simply says, these are minimum standards that we all adhere to. We all, and voluntarily adhere to, and it's not imposed upon by anyone, and whatever government reinforcement of that process without becoming the regulator or the guarantor itself, I think is, is something that is part of what we're trying to explore, at least one avenue that I'm keenly interested in, because I'm concerned about Mr. Uh, Mackesy sitting there and, and having to uh, make judgments on impairment and, and maybe the only, the only indication of uh, impairment is a failure to meet a contractual obligation within the state and he may not have access to the uh, mm -hmm. kind of information he needs to determine the depth of that impairment and, 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 the, uh, and the consequences to the guarantee fund that he runs. Um, let me, if I could just ask one further question. Uh, in terms of, of, uh, of running a guarantee fund, anybody can answer this. Um, and, and you do have some limitations, I guess, on, on how much of a call you can make. But um, do, you, do, you have, do you have concerns about the capacity of the participants to pay in a timely fashion? In other words, do you in effect have to, uh, you said you didn't have the legislative mandate to in effect bank the obligations that you have on one side versus your call. Um, is your call adequate? Um, is it bankable in terms of, uh, of overcoming a, a time lag in meeting obligations that the, that the fund has committed itself to? Representative McMillan, uh, First, I want to point out that, that in Minnesota, the Guarantee Fund has its own officers, and they run their show separate and distinct from the Commerce Department. But I can tell you that, that we're in constant contact, and I look over their shoulder and, and give them a jab every once in a while. From the discussions I have had with them, uh, they tell me that based on past precedent, that when they levy, uh, virtually all of the assessment is collected, that they do levy. So I, I don't have concerns about their ability to collect up to the maximum that they're <clears throat> allowed to collect for 1991 and into the future. Um, just to draw on a, com a comparison, I don't think this, uh, this covers any life uh, policies or life type of contracts, but uh, Lloyds of London, to the degree that they reinsure in the United States, basically leave uh, one year's premiums in escrow in the United States. Uh, is there some argument for, for guarantee funds being funds in fact instead of obligations to 
meet certain obligations that would remain an asset of the companies that advance it and therefore they could earn on those assets but they're held in at least some portion is that a part of, of credibility or is that necessary in your judgment that was raised by one of our uh, prior panelists well, Representative McMillan, uh, I think you raise an interesting point. One of the concerns that I have heard expressed by the insurance industry about a pre-funded situation is that uh, uh, I think they have worries that some state legislatures in, uh, in difficult times may get in and grab those funds and do something else with them. Uh, I don't know if that's sufficient reason not to have a pre-funded uh, operation but that is one it's of the a sufficient reason to draft I, the legislation carefully that is true but uh, yeah. no no I don't I wouldn't advocate it to have be accessible by anything other than the contractual obligations up for which it was created I think my time has expired has it not Madam it Chairman? has indeed <laughs> Mr. Bruce uh, thank you uh, Madam Chairman uh, Ms. Horton does your association support uh, uh, a, a model act so that we can get rid of some of the diversity among all the states? Our association has supported the NEIC model act. Um, the diversity comes when the act, the bill is actually introduced and uh, as, par as all legislative processes are, there are certain accommodations or, or modifications made for a variety of reasons. Um, but we are supportive of the NEIC uh, Model Get Life and Health Guarantee Association Act. Have you ever testified in the state legislature in favor of the Model Act? I have not personally, but ACLI staff has. All right. Mr. Uh, Mackesy, is the Model Act in effect in Minnesota? Uh, Representative Bruce, uh, no, it is not. Uh, it is in terms of the guarantee fund. It has been been hotly debated uh, in the last session, and uh, it was finally put on the shelf pending further study. But in Minnesota, we we have some some uh, free thinkers in the legislature, and I say that in the best sense of the word. And they come up with ideas like mandated borrowing and uh, possible indexing of limits and so on and things like that. So I. I don't know if, if we will ever adopt the model lock, stock, and barrel, but I think it would probably be the, the basis for our beginning. As, does the Department of Commerce regulate insurance companies in Minnesota, or is that another agency? No, we do that, Representative. Did you ever do an audit of uh, Midwest life within the last six months? Uh, no, Representative Bruce, we did not. Is there a reason why? Well, I've only been the Commerce Commissioner for the last six months in Minnesota. Uh, How about I don't, seven months ago then? <laughs> hey, I, I, don't, uh, I don't have all of that, uh, that history uh, at my fingertips, to be why, very candid. Why do you believe that the state of Minnesota only knew that this company was in trouble when they sent notice to their policyholders that they weren't going to pay? Well, I think, Representative Bruce, that, uh, that via the grapevine, um, our people probably had some indication of this, but I don't think they had any hard facts. You're certainly a subscriber to all the rating systems for insurance companies. Are you aware that any of the rating companies had, had dropped the rating of Midwest Life? What, was I aware? Were you aware or did they, in fact, drop the ratings? I would really have to check that with, with our assistant commissioner who, who deals with uh, insurance on a daily basis. At the present time, do you have any auditors reviewing the stability of life insurance companies presently licensed to do business in the state of Minnesota? Uh, yes, we do, Representative Bruce. And how many companies are presently under review? Well, there are uh, only uh, two companies at, uh, at this point in time um, that we are taking a serious look at. And how did it come to your attention that these companies were needed to be uh, audited? Um, well, Representative Bruce, I'm not so sure that uh, that's public information that I it's can right. really share with this committee. That's a good answer. Thank you. I don't, uh, I'm just probing. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Sarfati, uh, 
what is your position of your organization toward a model act? We very much favor uh, enactment of the existing NAIC model act. And, and what I is have your position towards uh, to that effect in many legislatures? Good. What is your position toward increased auditing requirements uh, by state uh, regulatory commissions? There are a variety of ways in which that can be undertaken, and uh, we certainly support uh, increased attention to those areas that appear by early warning systems to warrant uh, in-depth investigation. Uh, that's something that we have been urging. What has your association supporting. done in the way of strengthening audits by state regulatory boards? Uh, I mean, we you... can't do much uh, beyond Jawbone, uh, Representative. Uh, we do not have uh, the resources ourselves to undertake uh, that in any direct manner, nor uh, is that really our role. Uh, but we are certainly seriously affected uh, by don't you pay out? Don't respect. you pay out on a loss? Absolutely. So we are certainly very and, affected by the results. And don't you tell your constituent associations that if losses continue, that there will be additional assessments? Uh, clearly, and they are acutely aware of it. And they do not support you in increased audits of companies no, doing no, no, business? No, 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 no. What I mean to say is that it is not the role of the Garrity Associations directly to undertake audits. Now, they may. No, I, I know that you don't do audits. My question was, do you support strengthening audits by the various commissioners yes. who regulate insurance? Yes, we do. And what have you done to encourage the states around the United States to say, we've got a problem, we need to have a better auditing system implemented? What have you done to do? Well, to we have that? requested that they refocus some of the existing uh, resources uh, to those areas that are most in need of attention. There are, for example, in many states, triennial exams of companies which uh, are, are, are uh, very late uh, and absorb resources that could uh, more productively be focused uh, on, uh, on companies that um, uh, have, uh, uh, with respect to which there are indications that uh, intensive um, Do you have an early warning system that you alert regulators? The that NEIC uh, has such a system. And Do you cooperate with them in their program? Yes, we do. And do you alert insurance commissioners when you've received notification that you have a troubled company? Uh, yes, we do. However, usually the information comes in the other direction. Does that uh, worry you? Uh, does it worry me? Um, I mean, you're going to be well, the, in this, see, there, there's, the FDIC, there, there's a you see, takes the attitude that they want to know trouble banks before the bank commissioners know it. Your attitude is that as long as the, no. the regulatory body tells you that you've well, got a trouble institution, well, you then know, you're I, just going to pay I think I understand out. your point. What I, uh, what I would say very clearly is that we do have a, a need, we, I believe, for uh, information at an earlier point in time so that we can prepare to take action. Uh, at an earlier point in time to help address the timeliness issue that uh, has been raised here. Uh, however, it, uh, uh, it is a concern of Garrity Associations and their members uh, that they may not um, subject themselves to some type of liability, that is, uh, uh, insurance companies, by in effect suggesting that some other company uh, may be in need of Mr. regulatory right. attention. Mr. Sarfati, the problem is that we want to have somebody that's responsible so that we don't have the two witnesses appear before this committee and say that their benefits have been cut by 30 percent and they don't know when they're going to get paid, but they don't know who's responsible. We'd like to have someone mm -hmm. responsible early on to make sure companies don't fail. I thank the Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sarfati, let me, let me ask uh, you a question. And that is that um, I'm concerned about the, the uh, consumer confidence that they have in uh, these insurance companies and what have you. And so my question is, wouldn't a system of immediate payment, uh, like they have with FDIC, increase uh, consumer confidence and reduce the likelihood of runs such as the one they had in Chicago on mutual benefit? Uh, I, I think you make a, a very excellent point, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, uh, I think it might. Uh, assist in, uh, in repairing that confidence. Um, there are some difficulties with that. Uh, I think as uh, Ms. Horton alluded to earlier, uh, some of them are simply informational. Uh, but also, I think some of it is an issue of, uh, of uh, 
uh, how much we can possibly promise under certain circumstances. Well, let uh, me let me the, let me let me ask you this. Uh, in our last hearing, there was testimony saying uh, that uh, you have you there were a number of life insurance companies that were deemed to be in trouble, could possibly be in trouble. Some because they had junk bonds, but some like mutual benefit, which uh, had a lot of of uh, real estate that in the days of the recession had lost some of their value. Now, mutual benefit had been thought to be a, a good conservative company and its uh, real estate holdings were looked upon favorably, et cetera, because up to this point in time, real estate was the way to go. But then when all of this happened, uh, their foundation became pretty shaky and getting the word about this, you began to have these runs on mutual benefit. Uh, and it seems that consumer confidence has been shaken considerably. And I would think that if I were in a guarantee business or in a life insurance company, I'd be real concerned about consumer confidence. I think it's absolutely critical. And so that's why I raised this question. And, and then it seems to me that one way of uh, reacquiring that confidence, which clearly must be shaken at this point in time, would be for some immediate payment rather than wait until sometime in the future when a person might have died out and the benef uh, benefactors, beneficiaries uh, get the, the little money that's going to be left and all that kind of different stuff, that if you had an immediate payment like FDIC, that could be restored. Uh, I think there's a lot of merit in what you say. Uh, I do think also, and this is the most difficult part of the issue, uh, is that there are there has to be a limit to what any guarantee system's capacity uh, can do to provide liquidity at some point. Uh, that is even true, I think, with respect to uh, the federal government. If a calamity should occur, uh, if there should be an, uh, a terrible crisis of confidence in, uh, in the banking system, and everybody wanted to take all their money out of the banks, uh, uh, the only possible response, I mean, the FDIC would be sucked up in, uh, uh, could be sucked up in days, and the federal printing presses would have to start uh, churning uh, night and day. And there, that, that's an extreme type of an example, but it is the same type of issue. Uh, as Ms. Horton indicated earlier, uh, especially in a larger case, it is important for the Guarantee Association to be able to utilize the existing assets of an impaired company. Uh, and for us to supplement that, um, insurance uh, regulatory authorities in the states routinely uh, will impose a moratoria on cash withdrawals, for example, uh, when, uh, when they see uh, a panic reaction occur. Uh, that, does, that can further undermine confidence. And it's a very difficult balance for, um, uh, for our regulatory official, uh, I think, in, uh, in determining what decision to make in a case like that. In the case of executive life, as I indicated earlier, uh, I th I, we do think it makes sense to have moratoria on cash uh, surrenders, but we do not necessarily agree with this 30% um, uh, temporary uh, haircut on immediate annuity payments. Some of these decisions are difficult, but I think your, your general point is, is very well taken and it is a difficult issue. Yes. It's often said that the industry pays for insolvency through guarantee fund assessment. But isn't it true that in many states, life insurance companies can offset those assessments against their state premium taxes in addition to deducting the assessments from their income for federal income tax purposes? It is, um, and I think there, um, uh, there's a really a misconception uh, about what the effect of all that is. Uh, we are engaged in negotiations with uh, rehabilitators and receivers and uh, insurance regulators on Midwest life, on executive life, on a host of other situations currently uh, uh, in, in front of us. Uh, it is uh, not unusual for us to see or to hear uh, from state authorities uh, that um, uh, our members perhaps should respond in one fashion where there is no tax offset and in another fashion where there is a tax offset. Uh, I think that's a very instructive situation. 
Uh, and I think if, it, if the issue were uh, whether the federal government uh, should uh, perhaps take full responsibility for, uh, uh, for guaranteeing the, uh, the insurance system uh, as well, uh, the, the, the government might then um, uh, realize that uh, limits are necessary and that not all contracts uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be guaranteed fully no matter how, how big they are and no matter what kind of interest rates they carried and things of that sort. So it's been our, our uh, experience uh, that state authorities uh, reacting to the, uh, the mandates of their, of their own state legislators um, take a somewhat different view of, uh, of, of uh, how guarantee associations should respond uh, to various um, uh, to types of situations. Um, and we believe that's a good thing. It is a good thing that the insurance industry and the state governments, in effect, participate together in the financial cost of insolvencies. After all, it is not the insurance companies, the solvent ones, or their policyholders uh, who were at fault for the, for the uh, uh, insolvency. Uh, nor is it the taxpayers who are at fault. But everybody ends up in the boat. <laughs> Ms. Harden, you wanted to answer that question um, before the filibuster. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak for how um, every insurance company deals with that issue, but uh, at Lincoln, in, for states where we pay an assessment and we do not have a tax credit in any way, um, we fully deduct, uh, we, we take a deduction for our, our assessments. We do not take a deduction for that portion of assessments which, uh, for which we get, get a benefit of the tax credit. So that is, so it's not as if we're getting two tax benefits. That's the way we treat it. Well, let me ask you a question then. Confidence or in the effective functioning of the guarantee system than the underwriting industry in this country or the, or the uh, salesman uh, out across the land selling the product. And, um, and maybe we're at that point. And I think if we can get at that point and reach some uh, uh, unified action on the part of our, our state regulators and their industry uh, behind it, then we can really make some headway at dealing with this. I, I for one, don't think the, uh, the answer to all these problems uh, rests here. I mean, Congress has demonstrated its capacity to deal with these kinds of issues and, and the SNL situation and the uh, some of the bank problems, and I'm not saying we're not going to solve those, but we're not necessarily, you know, the first out of the starting blocks to um, <clears throat> deal with something like this. So I think a lot depends upon the capacity of the industry and, and the respective states to, uh, to be responsive in this situation. Um, I would like to, uh, if I could go back to Mr. Maxey just a minute, uh, maybe this relates to something that uh, Ms. Horton referred to, but um, in, in, um, with regard to your capacity to, to uh, monitor from the standpoint of the state of Minnesota, um, the information necessary to compute guarantee fund assessments or to make judgments about solvency and impairment, do the proposed um, uh, changes in standards by the NAIC address this adequately from your standpoint? Um, <clears throat> Representative McMillan, uh, I think generally speaking uh, that they do. Um, one of the, uh, the problems that we have in Minnesota, uh, which I inherited, is that, uh, that in the insurance part of the Commerce Department, um, we are understaffed. And the recent legislature uh, enabled us to probably triple to quadruple our staff uh, and we are in the process of interviewing and then we're going to have to hire and then we're going to have to train and then we're going to have to season and unfortunately all of this is going on uh, at the particular point in time where unfortunately we need people right now we don't have the bodies necessary to do what has to be done regardless of, of who's establishing the standards and that that happens to be the case in Minnesota, and, uh, and we're swimming real fast uh, and doing some internal shifting uh, 
to try and overcome that in the short term. Well, I realize the other 49 states are not your responsibility, but would you hazard an opinion as to whether you think most of them are in the same boat you are with respect to staffing and... Uh... Well, uh, Representative McMillan, it, it is a hazardous opinion uh, because I just don't know, but I, hazardous but I hear some, some <laughs> shop talk and I think that, uh, that many states are in that particular situation. Uh, I was discussing <coughs> with our our deputy for banking the other day the fact that we are much more heavily staffed in the banking area than in the insurance area and I said give me the history on that and he said well back in the 80s when we had problems with the ag banks in Minnesota uh, the legislature responded and uh, and tripled the number of bank examiners so <coughs> now we're in good shape for bank examinations and maybe sometimes it takes a crisis or many crises to bring those things home. And, That's uh, like uh, train, training firemen after the fire started. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask this question. If, uh, forgetting a minute, uh, federal regulation, but suppose the idea of a compact were pursued <clears throat> and that the states um, among themselves agreed that there are certain regulatory functions that we could consolidate, that if we basically have common standards <clears throat> that we all agree to, then maybe couldn't we, as a part of this compact, create uh, one fact-finding uh, um, group that basically serves all of our interests at much lower cost in a much more effective manner? Well, Representative McMillan, uh, in, in theory, I, I subscribe to that. The, the thing that would concern me is uh, all the pushing and shoving that would go into establishing the standards. And I'm not convinced that uh, the standards would be tough enough. And I, I guess that, that I would subscribe to a, a compact with probably some minimum standards, but I wouldn't want to say that Minnesota might not uh, want to regulate tougher than whatever those standards were. Well, one final follow-up to that. Isn't that maybe a role that, um, that is a legitimate role for the Congress to play in saying, well, here's what this, based upon the recommendations as a part of this compact, here's what the standards should be now. You all go do it. We're not going to uh, try to conduct that operation, but here's what is minimal to restore the confidence of uh, in the industry across this country, and, and that's what the compact would basically be um, structured around. I think that's worthy of consideration. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <coughs> You want to ask some questions? Um, Why don't you just ask that question? Mr. Oxley. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. In my uh, opening remarks, I uh, referred to a New York Times uh, article uh, on June 24, uh, and my question is uh, based on that. Uh, that article suggested several shortcomings of the Life Insurance Guarantee Fund system, which, uh, first of all, questioned the ability of the Insurance Guarantee Fund system to handle the potential executive life and first capital insolvencies. Uh, secondly, argued that it would take years for the funds to raise enough money to pay consumers who want to cash in their policies immediately. Thirdly, question the non-uniformity uh, of state guarantee fund coverage. Uh, four, suggested that billions of dollars in pension money remains outside the guarantee system, essentially uninsured. And five, stated that it would take the Hawaii Life Insurance Guarantee Fund up to nine years to gather enough money to pay off executive life policyholders in this jurisdiction. Uh, I'm wondering if um, each of you could address those uh, five uh, criticisms uh, and uh, how you might uh, propose a solution to, uh, if indeed those are problems. Uh, uh, I, I'm uh, aware of the article you refer to. <clears throat> Let me say that uh, it was really one of the worst pieces of, uh, of journalism I've seen in a long time. Uh, and I was rather shocked uh, uh, to see it from, uh, from the New York Times. Uh, they got a lot of things wrong. Uh, they got, uh, uh, but I think the uh, Hawaii illustration uh, 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 is indicative. In effect, they assumed that the face amount of all the contracts uh, had to be paid 
on a gross basis all at once. Well, that's not how insurance works. It never worked that way, and that's certainly not how a, a guarantee system uh, works, and, uh, and, and, it, and it never has either, really. Uh, in effect, they assumed that uh, everybody who had an insurance policy up and died instantly, uh, and maybe after reading that article, uh, uh, as some of them did. I hope not. Uh, but it's, it's <laughs> it uh, certainly shocked the heck out of me. Um, the fact is that it uh, won't take uh, anywhere near that long for Hawaii or, uh, or, or any other Garrity Association state to, uh, to be able to address its uh, obligations in executive life. I cannot get into um, in much detail at, uh, at, at the present time as to what that will be, um, <clears throat> but our capacity uh, uh, on an annual basis is very significant. Um, and with respect to whether we can bank some of that, uh, yes, in a, in a, yes, we, we can, even if it is not entirely uh, uh, usable uh, or, or required to be paid out uh, immediately. If we know we're going to need it up to the limits established in the guarantee laws, then we can assess it now. And then the, and then the uh, assessed companies will know that that is a liability, and they can, uh, and they can provide for that. Uh, we can also assess over a several year period. Remember, these are very long term ob obligations. And remember, too, that Executive Life has billions of dollars uh, remaining. It is not a hollow shell. Uh, what we are currently doing is, uh, is, is working at, in developing a plan with the California Conservative, despite our disagreement over the 30% issue, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to restructure contracts and, uh, and, uh, and we hope uh, sell them off to solvent carriers. Uh, the uh, I don't remember your the, the list of the five items, Seriatim, uh, uh, Mr. Oxley. Do you want to go? Let's go through them. But sure. Your first, the first message is don't believe everything you read in the papers, right? Right. <laughs> That's good because I, I agree with that. Um, first of all, the, the ability of the insurance guarantee fund system to handle the potential executive life and first capital insolvencies. Well, we believe we have the capacity to handle them. Uh, secondly, uh, that it would take years for the funds to raise enough money to pay consumers who want to cash in their policies immediately. Now, I, I, I just addressed that in the context okay. of Hawaii, and I, I believe that that is not true. Okay. Uh, with the idea that that's not likely to happen, I mean, that's... Uh, uh, well, there may, there, there may be moratoria on... There are now, and uh, as I said, if everybody wanted to walk, if all depositors wanted to walk from um, the, the Bank of America or... Uh, or or, or City or, or, or Chase, uh, they can't liquidate all of their assets at once. It's not possible. And the FDIC wouldn't have the money. It's that type of issue. Uh, so in other words, it's the wrong question. Okay. It's the wrong question. Uh, the non-uniformity of state guarantee fund coverage. As I indicated in my initial testimony, for the vast majority of people, there is, there is uniformity of coverage. Now, the issue was raised about certain types of contracts that fund pension plans, and, uh, and, and the chair raised that issue in her opening remarks, and, uh, and we have not uh, addressed that. But I think I did indirectly in the sense uh, uh, by saying that, that these are, are, in some respects, contracts purchased by, by sophisticated corporate purchasers, and the insurance company provides no direct uh, promise to an individual person. That is not the case with respect to, for example, as I understood it, the two initial witnesses who did have a direct promise. They will be covered. Now, there is, there is a degree of, uh, uh, of, of disuniformity in coverage of so-called unallocated funding obligations, of which GICs are a, are a type. Um, and that is not, that's not just a mistake. These are, these are decisions that, that state legislators made uh, deliberately. And one of the reasons why many states exclude coverage for that type of product, and why many other states and the NAIC Model Act significantly limit coverage of such products, is because of the danger that these <coughs> very large contracts uh, can be purchased uh, in large amounts very quickly, chasing the highest interest rate. And if there is a third party guarantee uh, available, then the moral hazard to the financial integrity of the entire system could seriously be at risk. That is, in effect, what happened with much broker deposits in the SNL situation. 
uh, and, and we could have huge amounts of money chasing all over the country, chasing, uh, you know, uh, looking for highest, the highest rates, and everybody else, ultimately other policyholders and, and taxpayers, would end up having to pay the bill. That's, that's, the, that's the crux of the problem. Thank you. Uh, unless the other witnesses have any comments, I'll be glad to yield back. Do we have any? I would just like to make just one observation to, to consider as far as uh, I, under, I appreciate the desire of, of people in a situation like this to want to immediately cash out. There are some difficulties, however, particularly in the life insurance area, that should someone actually surrender a policy because of their age or their health, it may be very difficult, um, if not impossible, to, to get insurance um, or at least at, get insurance at the same price that they've been paying. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Oxley. I want to thank the witnesses for appearing before us. Your testimony has certainly been very valuable to us. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>